here. Into the microphone more. Can you hear me better now? <laughs> I did teach for a long time, so I can uh, still have a little diaphragm left here. Uh, my name is Tom Sullivan, and uh, I'm a, a retired faculty member uh, dragged back by uh, the library by Troy Swanson in the library, who put your hand up, Troy, who put this together. <laughs> I was asked to come today to moderate discussion on art. That implies, of course, that there are going to be some immoderate things done that need moderating, and I certainly hope that will be the case. Um, I just have a few opening remarks to kind of define the subject area and some of the major questions, and then Justin Sinistad from Philosophy and Alan Troyer from the Art Department will be making uh, more particular uh, uh, detailed presentations immoderate claims. One of the questions that you hear from people when you introduce them to things that are new in, in art, and art is, especially in the last century or so, has been all about what's new, is a sort of defensive response that they have when they say, you call that art? That seems to be a, a question that people in our day and age have to negotiate a lot. As, as contemporary artists stick new things in our faces and say, this is a work of art. And it doesn't fit any of the categories that we have. It's not a picture of a barn or a bridge. Uh, who, knows what, who knows what it is? <laughs> so the response often is, you call that art. And I think uh, negotiating this confrontation with, uh, with new things in art and trying to understand what art is and what art is all about is the essential subject of the, the discussion today. And we, in our planning, talked about we, we really would like any participation, any questions, those of you who, who want to uh, react to, what, to what's being set up here. Uh, Justin has a handout that he's going to pass around, and, and I'm going to talk about some of the overarching questions that we came up with in our planning. Um, I think the fries are done. Um, how do we handle the confrontation with what is new in contemporary art? How do we know that something is art? Who are the authorities that can tell us? Are those authorities, do those authorities exist somewhere in our culture? Or are they internal to us? How can we have the confidence to make that decision? Is art something that you have to understand intellectually? Do you have to be able to get a meaning out of it for it to be art? Or is there another kind of experience that you can have with a work of art that's sometimes called an aesthetic experience that is somehow not dependent on your having a kind of understanding of it that you would have of, say, a newspaper article. If there is an aesthetic experience, what is it? Is everybody capable of having it? How do we value art? What is the relationship between art and consumerism? Uh, you all read or hear, I'm sure, from time to time about a work of one of the old masters being sold at auction, or one of the new masters <laughs> being sold at auction for millions of dollars. How does it get to have that price tag on it, does that have anything to do with whether it's any good or not as a piece of art? Can we, uh, can we judge art based on uh, Christie's catalog? Um, does art have to be creative in the sense that does it have to produce something new? Does an artist have to always come up with something new? Does art have to involve a high level of craft? For example, there's a painting, I think it's in the Art Institute, that's all black people see it, it's not all that. When people see it, they say, first of all, you call that art? And then the second thing is, my kid sister could do that. Okay? And the so remark about the kid sister, usually, at least to me, I, I interpret it as, as saying, that didn't when require colors. any talent or craft or ability to do this. Therefore, I don't know if that's art. Does art have a social responsibility? Uh, these works are uh, uh, shared among us. 
different ways. There's a Picasso in the Civic Center uh, plaza. Uh, belongs to all of Chicago. All of you are probably familiar with the image, even if you didn't know it was by Picasso. So uh, it's there in our midst. It's maybe making some kind of statement. Uh, does that statement uh, carry with it some obligation? So these are the kinds of general questions that we talked about in planning the session today. And, uh, and I think I'm going to turn it over next to uh, Justin. And I hope that people will get involved in critiquing whatever's going on here. My intention is just to give you a few minutes, first of all, of some notion of the visual elements or what? Did you try to hear? now? Yeah. Okay. My job is to try to give you two things. First of all, a little bit of the visual elements of, uh, of uh, what goes into art, as I believe. And then secondly, to give you a little bit of theory, and I outlined those things on that handout that you have, and I'm hoping that uh, after that, when, uh, when Dallin begins to introduce the images to us, we can critique and discuss, and we're just gonna have a free-for-all, and you join in and do what you want. First question is, is that art? And uh, I'm gonna give you my opinions about things, and you can critique can you call them as a truth. My sense is that it isn't art because it isn't doing anything that we can judge. And that nevertheless, if you try to do something else with that, you turn a single element into a combination of elements and then you can talk about how they relate together. So that art has something to do with the ways in which ideas or things are related and what we can understand and feel about those relationships. Anytime you make a judgment in a sentence, you have to have a subject and a predicate. And anytime you judge anything, there have to be at least two things to judge. Of course, art involves many things to judge, and they're not all visual, but I'm just giving you a sense of a, the framework of what goes into this business. So if we had, you know, a whole bunch of uh, elements in our frame, then we could compare where that element was in the frame. You might say, well, that says something, but I don't like it. Uh, it's, it's out of whack or something of that sort. On the other hand, one might say, well, here's something that uh, has a little more to say, but it doesn't say very much. And on the other hand, I could turn it that way and I would say, well, it says something different from what was said with the previous image. But that doesn't say very much either. Did you want to say something? Okay. So, on the other hand, I might think that I'm saying more when I do something of that sort, or that I, yes.
at those two lines there with that overlay, it makes the lines look like they're bent and so on. So somebody might play games with your eye in the elements that go into the visual process. Sometimes we think that something has more uh, acceptable composition or a more comfortable look to it. So in this case, there are various dimensions involved in these three figures, and the Greeks thought that they could make a mathematical uh, formula that would say what was the ideal uh, width to height ratio, and they would call it something like the golden mean or something of that sort. So there are things that occur in our thoughts about what is comfortable, what is rational, what is balanced, what is imbalanced. You perhaps look at that image and say, aha, and then you're not sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one can ask, uh, you know, if I made it go that way, you might say, ah, it looks like a goose or something. If I made it go that way, it may look like a bird of prey. So that there are elements of how the psyche affects different relationships. And of course, you've all seen images such as that, where what we concentrate on determines the effect that we have. And the modern movement, well, modern, I can call it from the turn of the last century, where the idea of negative space becomes a conscious element in what is composed. And so Moore and, and others who are trying to talk about uh, the interaction of the stuff that isn't there as well as the stuff that is there to make the impression. But all of these are formal things, and that's the point I'm trying to make. It has nothing to do with the subject, unless you want the subject to be part of the form. The interactions have to do with the way in which something is presented, and not what is presented. Here's an image that most of you are familiar with, and you might, I don't know how to get that back. Um, by the way, can I back off on this a little bit? Okay. Because I have another larger one. Now, you're all familiar with this so-called yin yang, traditional ancient Chinese or Korean figure. But in terms of its being a piece of art, does it say something to you? And is there uh, a way in which you could critique it? Now, I just remind you that this would look different to you than that would. And you can begin to say, well, is one of those presentations right and another one wrong? And I think that you may have the ability to make that judgment without knowing why. There may be something that your mind prefers as being the orientation of this figure. Or if I do something like that, it changes the effect on you. You might say that darker colors are heavier. Do they belong at the bottom or do they belong at the top? Or is there some balance point at which the heavy overweighs the light? Or does it begin to get a sense of rotating? I'm sorry, I'm not showing the figure well. Is there a point at which this begins to look like it might want to rotate? Or just before it rotates? Or is it too rotating or something of that sort? So the point of all this has to do with the idea that the artist presents you with feelings that come out of the sensations that you get, and it has zip to do with whether or not you recognize the subject or like it or hate it or something of that sort. So my contention is that art deals with form. Okay. Um, having said that, I'll just continue here with some thoughts about, which is outlined on your work here, but I just comment a few things and then we'll get into some critique of particular pieces. Um, there are many views about what art is, and uh, I don't want to bully anybody with my view, but I do think that some of the views are uh, not going to hold up. The idea that Art is creative, for example, seems to be one, one common and popular and, and uh, acceptable notion. 
Therefore, there are people who've decided to be destructive just to piss other people off. You know, they'll say, okay, we're going to take sledgehammers and clobber a toilet to pieces, and that's going to be our art because I'm not going to admit that art is creative. It can be destructive too or something. There is a lot in the art world that is done clearly for purpose of breaking old rules or getting attention, and sometimes in terms of trying to get money out of it too. So not all serious. Um, I won't critique these various notions that are under point A about what art might be, but I would say that they all have certain limitations to them, and you know, another discussion would be fun in which we could, we could get into that. Uh, I would suggest, by contrast, point B is my view. Uh, this is very sum summated, and uh, it probably could bear some explanation, but I would say art is what an artist does. And what that leaves out is the idea that art is accidental, or that art just happens, or that art is beauty, or that art is in the eye of the beholder. So I don't consider a sunset to be art. I don't consider a beautiful model to be art and so on, because there's no artist and there's no intention. So when I say good art is what an artist does well, I mean a good artist is the one who has the capacity to bring about the things which he intends to bring about, and that that does not happen apart from his work. And the master artist is, as Tom was asking, a person who has a skill or a craft, and he can communicate what his, what his intention is. And then I would add a third level, and this is where I think, uh, you know, our social and uh, our moral views come in, that you could say that valuable art is what enlightens us. But an artist can be a good artist, but he may be using his good art or his skill at art in a way that you would think is not valuable or not enlightening or doesn't do anything for us as human beings. So I would want to add that. Of course, this is a fairly conservative notion, and, and much of what I'm saying, I think you would find in, for example, Socrates. I do think that art is not beauty, and it's not accidental, as I've mentioned. Spilled paint is not art from, my, from this perspective, and I think that uh, People who think that uh, Jackson Pollock, for example, is just has just spilled paint, haven't seen him work, and haven't thought about the work. But you know, if you give your kid a bicycle and run the tires through paint and let him drive around on a campus, I mean on a canvas, that's pretty accidental. Or if if you uh, take radio tuners and tune them at random together and record the results, that's pretty accidental, and I don't think either of those would uh, merit the name art, even though they do get a lot of publicity. So I've tried to say that art involves form, and that in art the form is everything, and that the subject is really not to be considered insofar as it, it, uh, it is separated from the form. It's not what is presented in terms of what is being talked about is what is presented in terms of how it is talked about or presented or depicted and what that how does for you. Point F, I would suggest that an artist uses senses and our sense experience, be they audible or visual or even the words and the sounds of the words on the page, that all art comes through our senses, but that not all art is sensational. And that sensational art is designed to tickle our senses for that purpose only, and perhaps because we like to have our senses stimulated, is used as a means for selling products or gaining uh, the attention of the public who come back and purchase it more and more. So in that sense, you could say that sensationalism is not enlightening at all. Is art creative? I don't know. I had trouble with this. I know that Einstein is creative, and what he is doing I would not call art. I think that art needs something new, but on the other hand, 
when I uh, when I listen to a Bach piece over and over again and so on, and it's a copy of a copy and it gets to be old hat, there's still always some fresh experience. It's his way of presenting something for us in an absolute way because we can't say what the story is that he's telling us. But nevertheless, the idea of the old and the new is a, is a question that can go on for a long time. I added a couple of points here. Uh, well, especially, can crazy people do art? And uh, I find that an interesting question because recently I've been thinking about art therapy and this craziness is inconsistent with the idea of being free and that creativity has something to do with being in charge of what you're doing rather than having some disease state expressing itself through you. So I think that's an interesting question about whether or not art can help a person be sane and is a way of taking freedom and responsibility and ownership rather than uh, make the world being rethought through your disease state. Finally, I summarize these ideas that art can be in the service of something or other, and that whether or not an artist is a skilled person depends on whether or not he can get the outcome, or she can get the outcome that she intends. But then we also have that further question about what outcome does she or he intend. And so art can be in the service of various things. If art is in the service of money, it tends to be sensationalistic, and it is, in effect, mental masturbation, and people pay for it because it feels good, and they come back and back to it over and over again and don't go anywhere with it, and there's nothing new about the sensations that are generated, and that's why people get upset when they say, I don't like it, because art doesn't always tell them what they understand or what they like. Uh, the second point is if art is in the service of power, we would call it propaganda, and I think that's a problem. And finally, if art is in the service of truth, it either gives a vision that the artist has, or in a more mystical sense, as Plato might suggest, it's used to reorient our thinking so that we can get a vision of the truth, so that the art itself doesn't present the truth, but it may motivate us to look with different eyes towards what you might say the truth is. Well, that's enough of that summary. I would say then, if I'm able to say that, that from my perspective, a true artist has the skill needed to affect our emotions and thereby improve the person and lead to truth. And the answer to the question that Tom started with, I would have to say yes, we do have to be able to get it uh, for it to be good art, but that means that we are not just being manipulated by somebody who knows how to get us to act a certain way, but we don't understand how we're acting. So really to get it is to understand what's going on and to benefit from that understanding. Now on the other side of it, does the artist always know what she or he is doing? I don't think so. But a great artist may have an intuitive mastery without being able to explain it. So I don't think that it turns out that artists are always capable of saying what they're doing. And in fact, sometimes it sounds ridiculous when they try to explain what they're doing. Uh, I'm going to ask Troy to take over with some images now. And maybe you're free to ask questions. But we're going to interrupt and, and chide. And we're going we're gonna to bug each other, too, with Tom and hey, anybody I, else who wants to Can I bug you now? The answer is, I don't know. Yes. Are you saying that in order to get it, in order to understand the work of art, I have to know the artist's intention, even if they may not know it themselves? No, I think you have to say, what do I get out of this piece? And is that something that I am uh, benefited by? Uh, does it make any difference what the artist's intention was at all? Well, if he's an accidental artist, I suppose no, but I don't think you would call it art if he wasn't in charge of the consequence of his work. I think it's a cop-out for people to say, yeah, if you could take anything you want from it, I don't know, because then that's accident and he isn't trying to teach anything. And if I learn something, I can learn something by looking at the sunset, but I don't consider that to 
You mean it doesn't mean anything I want it to mean? No, I think you should also think of it. Um, can you guys hear this? Okay. I, I like to mumble and I like to talk to chalkboards. So you're going to have to yell if I start to do either one of those things. Luckily, there's no chalkboard. On the intention, the intention of an artist. I think that you shouldn't have to know anything about that. I think that the, the work of art stands on its own. And that the artist is dead when you're looking at the work. <laughs> Why? No, I don't think that knowing the intention has to do with knowing. Just while, uh, while Dallin is setting up some of his images, I, I would say that the artist may not have a conscious knowledge of what he's trying to get across, but he's communicating something that we may be able to read if he's a skilled person. And uh, in that sense, he has a vision of life or something of that sort. Now, it may be just, this is how I see things. It may, on the other hand, be, I think I should stop people from loving war or beating each other up. Or I think I should make people love war and start beating each other up. He may have a conscious intention. But in any case, I think he is trying to communicate something that he's not just doing it for himself except to say, this is my vision. But doesn't it make a Frank Lloyd Wright house stand up so much straighter if you know that he's had an affair with someone? I don't see how that's relevant. <laughs> okay. So the work of art then... Stands on its own. Stands on its own. But it stands on its own in the sense of an idea embodied in the art is being communicated to somebody. I don't know if he wants to make money for it or whatever, but the message is in the art. There's a message. So, is... Is anything by Picasso good because it's by Picasso? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because it's worth a lot of money. Why? Because it's by Picasso. Is it? It's circular. But is it Picasso? Or is it the work? Neither one. It's the culture and what we've made of Picasso and the work. It's Are nothing to works? do with the, bun the monetary value. has nothing to do with the art or with the artist. Artworks reflect the, the values of the culture they're created in. I don't agree with that either. Why not? <laughs> Some artwork reflects the culture, but other artwork changes the culture and changes the values of the culture. Those are the people who set the new ground, a, a box or, or the whatever. Impressionists or the Can something exist if it's not popular? Sure. My whole uh, adolescent period, for example. <laughs> 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 I what an image. <laughs> <laughs>
both deities of wisdom. True and false depending. The viewer's eye. You could say formally they had, they reflect each other, or they're both sort of cross form in some general sense. Yeah, think about this in terms of just those squares and circles. I mean, don't think about the subject, right? Because the subject says something about this, but think about the way that the arrangement of the form is, what sort of this <coughs> sort of X and Y kind of thing. Again, you're having to relate it to something to try to make the difference, but how similar are these things? That's a very good question. Did you I don't know if you heard it, but the question was, why are the pieces put side by side when obviously they weren't presented that way originally? And that's because in our effort to try to talk about art, we have contrasts and comparisons so that we can refine our notions about what's being said and how it's being said. And, and she's right. She's got me nailed on the fact that I said that the thing should stand alone. Right? The thing should stand alone. And you can, I mean, now that they're both together, you will have a harder time analyzing this, but, you know, close one eye. <laughs> right? Well, I would suggest it doesn't stand alone because I bring to the experience and knowledge of what a bull is, and I bring to the experience and knowledge of what a bicycle is, and I know that this man or woman is able to give the impression of a bull with parts of a bicycle in a way that brings a new image out of something that nobody ever thought of before. What if you didn't know that, that stuff? You'd still if I didn't know it was a bull... Would you still get an idea, a subject idea, even if you didn't know it was a bull or know what a bullish nature is? Well, then it would still have the formal qualities that you might find interesting and appealing of the slight curve and the leather of the saddle and the shiny handlebars and irregular organic shapes and so on. So it would have a purely visual impression or purely sensual impression, but clearly a person who's doing this at the turn of the last century has in mind all of these cultural aspects too, which play off against what's going on here. And that's why I say the piece of art does not have an isolated message in itself apart from 
what you know or what the psychology or that you bring to it and so forth. John. Got away from her question though. She asked why are they presented together? The reason why they're presented together and why you do that in a class is because knowledgeable people know the history of art. They know the main monopoly of things that are sort of outstanding and so they put in the context of this is a family resemblance to that or it's contradictory to that or it's taken on the ground and so forth. So therefore the comparison is a valid one because it puts one in more in the realm of a knowledgeable viewer that you may not have that artistic background. So again, we do have to know more for it to be good or maybe better. Yeah, and these comparisons are teaching us how to you look at it. There was a comment over there? Yeah. I'd say these pieces in particular don't stand on their own because they have something to do with a spiritual school of thought. I mean, no one would look at that crucifix the same way if they had absolutely no knowledge of what Christianity is or what that symbolizes. They would think, oh, that's just some man attached to two pieces of wood rather than, oh, that's my savior or whatever. Right. So right. there's no way that they stand up for it. That's true. And the only way you could do that is if you get into purely abstract art, which some artists try to do, and then they deal with disconnecting from the from the uh, context, you might say, and try to focus on what is only there. Would it be fair to say that you need there's a minimum sort of level of information that you need in order to be able to approach works of art. And the original question a gentleman back here asked is, what if you didn't know, what if you didn't know about bicycles or both? And I'm trying to imagine that person. <laughs> okay, I mean, you have, to, you have to bring something to the party. Tom, that's easy to imagine. That person is a two-year-old or a three-year-old that doesn't know bicycles and both. Can that two-year-old get an artistic experience or be elevated or enlightened or yes. something like that? Sure. Oh. I'll say sure. Gentlemen, oh. prove it. <laughs> you, have, you have the original comment, right? I, well, I think that everything that you see everywhere has an effect on you no matter what. Because it's just, this is your world that you're living in, and it might affect everybody else differently from you, but it's going to do something to you. Positive, negative, whatever. It's going to do something. And that's just, I think that's just the way it works. I, I, don't, I can't even explain it, like, very uh, smartly or whatever. I don't really know why it works that way, but it does affect you. I, I don't care what anybody says about Of course, that. when you say whatever you see, but then you may experience things that you don't see or see things that you don't experience because you're not paying attention to them and you aren't putting them into context, like what you went past driving to school today still or something of that sort. it may affect you still. Yeah. But, and but so it's, this has to do with... It's just a bicycle seat and it's just... No. Why? What? He's using the big word. Did he say his dog? We got any psychology teachers around? <laughs> Which means? The, 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 the sum is greater than the, 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 the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Basically. Yes, you have a bicycle seat, you have a handlebars, but because you put them together in that way, it's become something greater than the bicycle seat and the handlebars. So, this goes back to a different point. Creativity is bringing together two things that didn't exist before. Poetry, we call that metaphor. Metaphor, right? This is a bull's head. No, it's not. <laughs> right, so we think of creativity in this relative sense of putting new things together that were already known, whereas we speak of God as the absolute creator, and then the lunatic in uh, near Washington is going to be God because he's a destroyer and is taking people out.
no rules. I think she's saying what may be skill for one person may not be for another, so I think the implication is there are no standards. And you're saying, yes, there are standards, and there are people who know and people who don't know. Yes. Just as there are in plumbing or in cardiology, there's also in art and in computer science and in pole vaulting and in uh, bicycle riding. Greg Lamont knows more about bicycle riding than any, I would venture to say, probably anybody else in this room. But that doesn't mean I can't ride a bicycle. It just means that Greg Lamont's going to Could we make a... A passing comment on that. Yeah, let's just start. Go. Let's get some new. Let's, uh, let's let's do. Let's <laughs> passing comment about this one on the left. Uh, okay, do, maybe okay. you need to this know something a, else. This this had a religious feeling to people. These had religious feelings. Is that, is that correct? And does this is this awe inspiring and spiritual for some for some people? If if you're into okay. Well, here's the last part before I go to the next slide. And this this work of art. Was, was under censorship because it's called Kiss Christ. This is a, a, a photograph taken of a crucifix submerged in a glass of urine. Now, it's disgusting. Before, it wasn't, was it? Somebody said, I need a title. I need a title. Well, I know. I'm, just, I'm saying but before. I need a title to make it make sense, right? Do you see how that can change what you're actually seeing? <laughs> this one has a title. I can't read that. That's French. <laughs> somebody, I bet somebody could read French. This is not a fight. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a picture of a fight. of a composition doesn't just include the visual, but it includes the context and the psyche and the thoughts that go along with it, and obviously that is not a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe, and he's playing games with how you can bring that into the work of art itself. But so, you know, it's a kind of an intellectual kind of art that has to play off the notion of our understanding of words and images and how <coughs> they relate. But doesn't that contradict what you say about form being everything? Yes. No, because I told you before that form is not just the purely visual line, color, and, and space, but it has to do with all the elements that you compose together, including the but contradiction context. of the context or something of that sort. So that you would say John Cage has form? Well, everything has form for that matter. I was going to just display a handful of rice on the screen but it doesn't have intentional and rational form that you can say takes you somewhere because what the artist wants to communicate. Down, what is that image on the left? Is that a photo from the airport? This is a photograph. Just a, a, a couple who are uh, obviously at an airport. How much of the story can you tell by just looking at it? Are they waiting for a plane? Or are they waiting to get on a plane? Is somebody coming in or somebody going out? How much of what you see tells you the story? Why is it obvious that they're at an airport? It's fuselogenous, like an airport. It's fuselogenous? <laughs> I don't think it's obvious that they're at an airport. I think that's even a word. <laughs> <laughs> it's fuselogenous. <laughs> it's it's fuselogenous. I, mean, I, I think, you know, that's a huge assumption, or that's in the title or the background. I don't see any anything that indicates clearly that they're at an airport. Yeah, I, I, it's, to tell you the truth, I don't have the title. But I think it's really beautiful. <laughs> right, and I'm assuming it's an airport. And it's, is it a, is it a weird thing? Is this art or no? The left hand image. Remember it's a photograph. Why? It's a 
photo. composition or interesting lines, but then a further question I would want to ask is, were those lines or that composition or those colors, were they evocative of something that has to do with what you think is the point? Is there a point? And that would be something that would take a really skilled critic to decide if this was intended as art or simply a snapshot for infor information purposes. What's the Whereas point? on the right hand side, of course we know that's intended as art, and it gives roughly the same kind of information. What's the, what do you mean by the image on the left having to have some sort of a point? I think I like what he was describing, that it's a beautiful object, and I enjoy simply looking at it. I don't feel that I have to get anything more than what is there. The light, the color, the composition, it's pleasant. It's Going what I would call beautiful. What else, what else do I need? Going back to Justin's statement about if it's art that I should get some benefit out of it. If I look at something and right off the bat, I'm not getting anything from it, but then John says, okay, because I have the knowledge about this particular piece of art and I can explain it to you, and then I suddenly look at it differently, so to say, through his eyes, and now I get some benefit. Where does it come to the point where I have to have it explained to me in order for it to benefit? Do I still consider it art if I need an explanation? I believe you do have to understand more about the artwork, but that doesn't mean that an artwork that you don't know anything about is like, has a lesser value. You see what I'm saying? Right, because some things I can look at and say, I, I feel this, this really inspires me for some reason or the other. Well, think about language, for example. You may not speak uh, Norwegian, read Norwegian, but uh, that's not the fault of the poet who's writing in Norwegian that nothing happening. So you might still think that that's a great piece of poetry, but we may be obliged to make ourselves able to read the language. So, but then if you're telling me I have to get that interpretation, then it will become art? I think the art is in what the artist is able to do, but it's good insofar as it can bring about this, this enlightening effect. But of course, people have to themselves be involved in order to be enlightened, and if they're not gonna bother reading the language, then they won't do it. Ooh, ooh, one more point? Yeah, well, we got two. I know, but I'm the moderator. You're the moderator, you can figure it out. Chuck Lady here said an interesting thing about we look at something and beginning to understand it. There may be another part of the problem is that we are impatient of, uh, when we approach new works of art often. And we look at them, and if we don't get it right away, then we say, our fame, my opening line, well, you call that art? I don't get that. Well, if you spent all the 20 or 30 seconds on it and you didn't get it, whose problem is that? So maybe what the, the problem of understanding, one way to solve that is to turn to the experts. Another way to solve that is to spend more time with the art. But then the so. artist isn't conveying to me, the interpreter's conveying to me. Right, and you and you want to rule that interpreter out. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. That's it. Wait, you, you decide who's going to try. I mean, I wish that you guys would make up your mind because you spent <laughs> the first part, or Justin did a lot, talking about what the artist need to do, needed to do, need, needed to have intention. Maybe he had intention, maybe he accidentally did it, but he had some vision. But then a little bit later, Dallin took over and we started talking how the viewer needed to do this and the viewer needed to do that. And well, the artist, maybe we don't even need a title and the artist is dead and whatever. So uh, who, who has the onus here? I mean, is it the viewer? Is it the artist? Is this a conversation where both need to go back and forth? I'm saying that the art object, it, the object itself, right, has the potential 
talk to come? To speak. Now, whether the conversation is long or short relies on how good it is, right? The goodness is potentially how long it can be what the conversation. So this is what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about this. How long is the conversation? And is it well done? I'd say the conversation is short because those are popular pieces and that means people like them. <coughs> they pay money for them. They're popular because they feel good. They're not popular because they do anything for the person. So the artist is skilled at getting people to buy his product, but he's not taking people anywhere with those images, which are simply evoking feelings that everybody <coughs> already has, a kind of mental masturbation based on not teaching them anything, but on stimulating feelings that are very familiar and feel good, and therefore I will pay for them and come back for them. Like a cliche. Like a cliche. Yeah. So are you saying that bad art is not art? <laughs> uh, no, I, I think, <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I think you could that. say this is an artist who is skilled at doing what he wants to do, but it's in the service of money making. Or, the people who do the soap operas are very capable artists in terms of getting the effect that they want, but it isn't elevating people. So you would consider it art even though it's at a low level? That's why I say there's a difference between good art as what an artist does well, and valuable art in that sense of enlightening or improving our humanity or something.
the gal over here in the... I guess I'm kind of confused because I feel like you guys are kind of contradicting yourself. Well, we hope so. But <laughs> are, you, so are you saying that art is what the artist's intended message is to the viewers? Mm -hmm. so, Which of us are we talking about? <laughs> to you in particular. We really do have different views. We're trying to have different views. But this is for you because I remember you saying that you're talking about art and that I, my question is, are you saying that art is what the artist no, I don't think the art is in the message which she intends, but is in the way in which she controls how that message comes right, through right, your emotions and your senses. Right, can I, can you perceive something to be art that I can't perceive to be? Well, I like can you're perceive... you're saying that you need the message to fully understand the art, but then why do some people cry in front of paintings and some people do not? Like, isn't it well, some people it? cry when they look at the sunset, but the nobody was trying to get them to go somewhere with that respect. I right here? Yeah, I have a question for you as a psychologist. Is that what you are? <laughs> I know, I don't know. Philosophy. Oh, philosopher. Oh, philosopher, okay. Um, how do you define creativity? <coughs> Just for you, I don't care. 
Right. By the way, to return to the idea so of creativity, I think <laughs> the ideas that come out are not new, typically. They're sort of universal ideas about what humans are about and what they should be about. Well, it's about the newness is in the form that expresses those in ways that grab people and in ways, perhaps, that older forms didn't grab them.
but I didn't shake my fist. I noticed that. <laughs>